The second lesson is taken from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. Let us listen for the Word of God. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was called up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, To keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Meet us where we are this day, O God. And open our hearts to you. Amen. Anyone who plays golf knows about handicaps. It's a number that is close to our average above par. For instance, uh, a 10 handicapper would typically shoot around 82, which is 10 above par. Everybody who plays golf carries a handicap. As in golf, as in life. Which is to say that we all carry handicaps in this game we call life. Our handicaps are the things that impede us. We call them by different names our weaknesses, our problems, our character flaws, our personality disorders, and so forth. But Paul, our apostolic friend, called his handicap his thorn in the flesh. Whatever our handicap is, and whatever it is that we may call it, generally, we hate it. We despise it. We despise what it does to us. And furthermore, we wish we were free from it. I contend that we all carry handicaps. Some are physical. Some are mental. Some are emotional. Some are moral. Some are spiritual. Our handicaps show up in our work. They show up in our family life, they show up in our relationship with God, and they often manifest themselves in our relationships with people. My guess is we all know what our handicap is. We all know what this 
thorn in the flesh is, this thing that sometimes derails our life or what we want to be, and we wish it would go away, or we could overcome it, or we wish we could overcome it. Today's scripture, in my mind, is one of the most important passages of the New Testament. It's from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. Paul, of course, was a church planner. And he organized this Christian community in the seaport uh, city of Corinth. The church was full of growing up kinds of problems, sort of like when we become an adolescent. For the Christians in Corinth, they were having trouble with their Christian identity and struggled um, and what it meant to live out the teachings of Jesus. Paul, in addressing an array of problems, became self-disclosing about his own problems. He didn't say it exactly this way, but I get the sense this is what he wanted to say. You think you have problems? Let me tell you about my own. He then told them that he possessed a thorn in the flesh, his handicap, his weakness, something that tormented him. He said that he prayed three times for God to take it away to no avail. Now the truth is no one really knows what Paul's handicap uh, was, and he never really says so every biblical scholar under the sun has an opinion about uh, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Bad eyes, uh, almost deaf, suffering from malaria or from uh, epilepsy, or unresolved guilt over something he had done, or that he had some facial deformity that made him physically unattractive. Some think Paul suffered from depression, others from anger management. And the truth is, we just, we just don't know. The theories are theories. What we do know is that whatever it was, it was a real problem for Paul. He was tormented by it. And us? What's our thorn in the flesh? What's our weakness, that handicap that, that uh, we so want not to be a part of us? There are a number of ways in which we uh, can think about our handicaps and how they affect us. But I have come to believe that there is this, this crucial intersection between our weakness, our handicap, and our faith. What I think I've discovered is that when it comes to faith, our primary question is not about doctrine or about theology. No, our primary question is, how does faith deal with our problem? How does faith deal with my handicap? For instance, if we're born uh, with some physical problem, one that um, renders us different from our peers... Our spiritual question will, will revolve around uh, how God, how faith deals with this in our life. Or if we uh, uh, grew up in a home environment that was, that was erratic or, or unstable, or a place where love was absent or uh, conditional, then our spiritual journey will view faith through this lens. Will faith provide me with stability and love? If we can't find that in the church, if we can't find that in the people who tell us that they're Christian, then we're not really very interested in following this man called Jesus. Or if there is... A if there's something where our handicap, whatever it is, prevents us from being the kind of person that we want to be, then we will look at our faith and God through that lens. 
Or if our desire is to have a, a, a secure, deep love, loving relationship, but we go through a divorce or a relationship turns out to be disastrous, then we'll ask how faith, how God deals with, with that circumstance. If we've lost somebody important or we've been uh, betrayed and that is the circumstance that we're always dealing with, then our question is, God, how do I see you in this? That becomes the way in which we view faith. And this struggle will determine the nature, the depth, and the character of our faith. All of us have our weaknesses or challenges or handicaps. Call it what we may. Our choices for how we face these, of course, are unlimited. We're sometimes angry or we're, we are rebellious or we're frustrated or we sometimes feel defeated. Sometimes we curse God. Sometimes we curse life that it's not fair. Sometimes we blame ourselves. Sometimes we think, how different my life could be if I didn't have to deal with this. And I wonder if Paul didn't have similar thoughts. I think that because he prayed three times, and my guess he prayed more than that, to be rid of this handicap. I mean, even the spiritual giants pray for relief. And what was God's answer? It was the answer that would shape Paul's life. Paul says this was God's answer. My grace is sufficient for you For my power is made perfect in your weakness. It's one of the most important truths of the Christian faith. And it is one of the great paradoxes of the spiritual life. Because it is through our weaknesses that God's power works in us and through us. In fact, it is in our handicaps that we think are our weaknesses that we discover strength and power. I mean, just look at people like Helen Keller, whose deafness, muteness, blindness uh, uh, molded the way she looked at life and molded her life of significance. Because here's the truth. The struggle to overcome our handicap using God's grace and power develops capacities in us that we would never would have had without them. Winston Churchill had a lisp that was so bad that someone advised him not to go into anything that required public speaking. Or Stevie Wonder, the great musician, you know, was born blind. Or British uh, physicist Stephen Hawking, who uh, suffered with ALS and through it became the greatest theoretical uh, physicist since Albert Einstein. And I remember Jim Abbott. Maybe you don't. He was born with one hand. He was a baseball player, pitched in the major leagues for 10 years, pitched a no-hitter while he was a member of the New York Yankees. One hand, one arm. Which is to say, when God's grace is sufficient, we access the power to develop capacities that we would have never developed uh, before. You with me? Uh, Some years ago, a young doctor delivered a a baby to a poor family out in Montana. The child was born with a cruelly deformed leg and had great difficulty in breathing. 
And the doctor thought of the unhappiness this child would eventually encounter and considered momentarily doing nothing to help his breathing and just letting the child expire. But uh, he breathed life into the child, and the child lived. Years later, this same doctor had a granddaughter who was stricken, stricken with a, a crippling uh, condition. But he learned about this young doctor over in the Midwest who had been getting excellent results in his treatment and care of this particular crippling disease. And so he took his uh, granddaughter uh, to see him. It turned out that the young physician was physically impaired and walked with a severe limp. And you guessed it. He was the baby. He was the deformed baby that doctor had delivered 35 years earlier. And because of his own infirmity, this young doctor had focused and specialized in crippling diseases. Which is to say... It is often our area of greatest pain that becomes our passion and our catalyst where we begin to sense and feel and experience the power of God to use our weaknesses for good, especially for the good of others. And I remember this story about this honors chemistry uh, student who, was, who began to have mental health issues while uh, she was in college. She was accepted to Vanderbilt Medical School, but while there, she went into several dark periods uh, in, uh, in her mental illness. She left school twice and was finally diagnosed with a form of schizophrenia and uh, mood uh, disorder. And then one day, she tried to end the pain and her life. Um, and after she cut herself uh, badly... Her phone rang, and it was her therapist who was calling her because she had missed an appointment. So help soon arrived. The medical student prayed, God, if you're out there, give me a reason to live. Well, she eventually finished medical school, and she's now a psychiatrist, and she's also a mental health advocate. She's active in her church. She serves in a clinic that uh, serves people with severe mental illness. And this is what she says, hope is the most powerful of all medicines. You hear what Paul is saying to us? You hear what the Christian faith is saying to us? It is through our weaknesses that we discover our strength. It is through our weaknesses that we realize our own inadequacy and let God in. It is through our weaknesses that God infuses us with power for God's great purposes. Or as Paul says it, when I am weak, then I am strong. Is it true? Can it be true? If we're blessed or discerning or we're just tired of having our life being uh, wrecked sometimes because of our weaknesses and handicaps, then we can begin to take on a certain humility. And when that happens and we take on this certain humility... We discover that we are not smart enough, and we are not clever enough, and we are not strong enough to figure it out, to solve our problem, to give ourselves the cure. Because humility is God's doorway. Humility lives in grace, and it is where God's power is made perfect in our weakness.